everybody, and welcome to NBA TV's Basketballography. I'm Andre Aldridge. Today we present the man who was the architect and mastermind of one of the most dominant franchises in professional sports history, the Boston Celtics. Arnold Red Auerbach was a demanding and fiercely competitive mentor who coached 11 Hall of Famers and led the Celtics to eight straight NBA championships during the 1950s and 60s. After his coaching days were over, he remained in the team's front office for decades, engineering another run of Celtic glory during the 1980s. But Auerbach and his trademark victory cigar have become enduring images in American sports, and his name is legendary in the city of Boston. But his story begins in the early part of the 20th century in New York City. Well, I grew up in the Williamsburg section of Brooklyn. It was a melting pot. You know, it was during Depression time, I was growing up, and you saw people who were hungry and people who were scrounging around for something to eat. And here you, you got a father, he's got four kids, and he's uh, breaking his hump. We had a cleaning route. He used to pick up from all the table shops around New York, and I would work all night pressing clothes. I used to run those machines. Pretty good. I would do like a hundred suits from oh, 10 at night to 8 in the morning. They said, so take the starch out of you, keep you humble. And he played basketball, which his father thought was, you know, stupid. He thought, you know, you should get into the cleaning business kind of thing <laughs> and leave the basketball alone. You'll never, it'll never amount to anything. It's just a stupid game. When I got out of high school, being from a small school, they weren't breaking the doors down to give me any scholarship. Uh, even though I made all Brooklyn second team, which was pretty damn tough in those days. So when George Washington came up to play St. John's or LIU or whatever, they'd scrimmage us. And Bill Reinhardt, the coach of George Washington, offered me a four-year scholarship. During his days at George Washington, Red's love for the game grew, though he soon realized that his true passion was coaching. I always wanted to be a coach because I thought it was uh, uh, a clean life or something I always wanted to do. And basically, I wanted to teach. After graduating from George Washington, Red was offered a job to do both at a local community college. But there was a more intriguing opportunity waiting as well. The job at that time would pay about $2,900 a year. But the NBA started, this is in 46, and I applied, I got the job, and it paid me my first year $5,000. So I took a gamble, I gave up a permanent job to go into there. After coaching the Washington Capitals for three years, Red moved to Boston as the new head coach of the Celtics. There he assembled a team with a freewheeling style of play, and he introduced fans to basketball's first great showman. Hi there. We had to sell the game. We barnstormed all through Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, Connecticut, all around we played exhibition. I think our first year we won uh, 20 some odd more games than they did the year before. But while the Celtics drew big crowds and played an entertaining brand of basketball, Red knew the team wasn't built to win a championship. We had no, no bona fide center with, with any kind of bulk. See, Ed McCauley was a Hall of Famer and he was a great player. But Ed McCauley basically was a forward. So I just uh, made a decision. There's only one way that Boston could go anywhere. That's to get a guy that could get us the ball. And Auerbach knew just the man he needed, a dominating college center named William Felton Russell. Bill Reinhardt, the coach of George Washington, came over to me and says, I saw a guy was a sophomore out of San Francisco. He says, I saw him play. He says, set your sights on trying to get that guy. But we had to figure out a way to get him because the number one pick that year was Rochester. 
Lester Harrison, the owner of the Rochester Royals, also owned the arena in which his team played, while Walter Brown, the owner of the Celtics, owned the ice capades as well. So Brown and Harrison got together and decided to strike a rather unusual arrangement. And Walter Brown made a deal with Rochester that if they don't take Russell, he would get them the ice capades. With the deal done, Red would get his man, acquiring the draft rights to Russell, but it was still considered a major gamble. You put your job on the line. If he turned out to be a dismal flop, <laughs> you know, we got nothing. And the first time Red got to see Russell play in person, he was concerned that his worst fears might be realized. He was playing in a uh, exhibition game and he played the worst game in his entire career. He was terrible. So we all went over to my house. I said to myself, it can't be. It just can't be. But it, it was. It was, just, it was just terrible. And he looked me right in the eye, Russell, and he says, Coach, he says, that was the worst game I ever played in my life. And it'll never happen again. And when he said that, I says, we got a winner. As the Celtics prepared for the 1957 season, there were many who questioned Red Auerbach's choice of rookie center Bill Russell. See, there were a lot of experts that weren't sure he was going to be a good player. He could rebound, he could run, he could play defense. But they didn't realize what else he did. He made everybody around him better. He blocked shots with a finesse. When he'd block a shot, we'd get the ball. It was the ultimate piece of the puzzle. And in Russell's debut as a Celtic, he would quickly learn just how much support he would receive from his new head coach. The first game I played, I was blocking shots. And most of the people had never seen anything like that. So one of the referees called goaltender. And Red jumped up and screamed and yelled and got a technical foul. At that time and that place, that meant so much to me. And I said, to you know, you know that's, that's really cool that you did it. He says, I can't ask my players to fight for me if I want to fight for them. Hey, how about carrying the ball, man? Just one time, huh? Red's fiery antics on the sidelines were legendary, but there was a method to his madness. It was all part of his effort to protect his players and give them every possible edge to help them succeed. Red are back, very unhappy about the call. They're your boys, and you gotta do what you gotta do to win. If this is what it takes to win, this is what you've gotta do. In 1957, the Celtics reached the NBA Finals against the St. Louis Hawks. Before Game 1, Auerbach showed his players just how much he cared about them and about winning. Kuzi and Shaman came over to me and he said, he said, uh, Coach, the basket is low. I said, oh, God, don't bug me with this nonsense. He says, we can touch the rim. We can never touch the rim. I said, show me. So they showed me the basket was low. Arnold runs after the general manager of St. Louis. He goes, hey, the hoop is off. In those days, they literally had the guy with the ladder and a 10-foot pole. The pregame battle may have been a draw, but Red and the Celtics would go on to defeat the Hawks and capture Boston's first NBA championship. The all-around play of the Celtics is too much for the Hawks to overcome. Boston down St. Louis to win the NBA's World Series for the first time and become the professional basketball champion. I knew we were a great team, but the only thing you could do was uh, pray that they're healthy, that's all. The following season, the Celtics reached the finals once again, but this time they were hobbled by injuries and lost to the Hawks. I felt in my mind that we were the better team. If Russell wasn't hurt, that might have entered my mind that maybe we need a little help somewhere. But it's harder to win it the second time than the first time. 
With Bill Russell healthy again, the Celtics couldn't be stopped. They stormed through the 1959 season on their way to the playoffs. Kuzi in the lane. Russell, dunk. And the Garden is going crazy. Executing Red's team-oriented offense to perfection, Boston cruised into the finals, winning their second title in three years. And from that point on, they refused to relinquish that crown. The Celtics reigned supreme over the NBA, defeating every challenger from the West. By 1963, the Celtics had won their fifth consecutive championship and sixth in seven years. But it would be the last for Bob Cousy. As the backcourt legend retired from the game, the team bid him an emotional farewell, and Red paid tribute to one of the cornerstones of the Celtic dynasty. All I've heard recently is how you're going to replace Bob. That's my answer. Can't be done because that's Mr. Basketball. After their sixth NBA title, the Celtics said goodbye to their great guard Bob Cousy. But more success was still on the way, and it was largely due to the discipline and work ethic instilled in them by their coach. Red Auerbach was driven to win, and he did everything possible to get the most out of his players. His approach was hard line, do it this way because I tell you to do it this way. You know, his MO was fear and intimidation, as they say. That's what guys responded to in those days. I mean, if a guy acts up or something like that, I used to say to him, would you like to play in Siberia? And they look at me, I said, yeah, like Minneapolis. I said, you keep doing what you're doing. I said, I'll arrange it. See, that's for you. Our practice sessions are tough, and we play a long, hard season. Albeck was the kind of guy who, who made things extremely difficult for us if we didn't win. Punish, punishing practices, long practices. And he'd have these torture drills where he would have you uh, jump from one end of the floor to the other on two feet, just jumping, jumping, jumping with your hands in the air. He'd have these drills where you'd be facing the basket, but he would be behind you. And you had to retrieve the ball. And the message was very clear. We could not afford to lose because he would make us miserable. He had a way of, of uh, making one or two guys mad or something before a ball game to stimulate you to get you going. Like a guy would be in the locker room before the game, maybe maybe having a cup of tea or something like that. And he'd say, look at you. We got a big game going on here sitting here drinking tea. Can't you play without your tea? Or another guy might have a candy bar. He'd just pick on the most mundane, stupid things that he could pick on to get your attention. I used to go in there, and a lot of times before a very clutch game, you know, you read about in the papers or you see in the movies about the inspiring uh, win one for the Gipper or all that nonsense. I used to do just the opposite. I, I'd go in low key as if it was another game. And, I, and I, basically I would say very simple, do what got you here. That simple philosophy would help the Celtics get back to the finals every year as they compiled a growing string of NBA titles. But the cast of players would change. They were bound together by Red Auerbach's system that emphasized the team concept. Red had turned his Celtics into a close-knit family, and as the championship banners filled the rafters of Boston Garden, the coach was filled with a sense of Celtic pride. It was a great feeling. I used to tell him. You know, when we won the championship, I'd say, how does it feel to be a member of the greatest basketball team in the world? i said, what more is there? That's it. Then they'd come back the next year, I'd say to them, well, did you have a good summer? you walk around with your chest out, member of this great organization, this great team. I said, now they're after you. Everybody's after you. You gonna let them take it away from you? From 1959 to 66, no one would take the Celtics title away from them. 
But they're at our back as coach. They compiled a record eight consecutive NBA championships and nine in 10 years. They were the NBA's reigning dynasty, and Red helped to fuel their growing mystique. He infuriated opponents with his famous tradition, the lighting of a cigar when he decided the Celtics had the game in hand. The routine became part of NBA lore. I didn't realize it was going to, you know, take off that way. But see, what happened was, you're 20 points ahead with three minutes to go or four minutes to go. Game is over. You see these coaches even today, you know, 20, 25 points ahead, three, four minutes to go. They're up there giving signals and they're pressing and they're doing this and they're doing all that kind of stuff. My idea was the game was over. So one day I just casually, being I'm sitting there, I lit up a cigar. So I sit there and I put my foot down, my feet down, I lit up a cigar. And all of a sudden it took off. That the red lights, the cigar means the game is over, blah, 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 relax. And that's what happened. But in 1965, Red decided his competitive fire could only burn for so long. He announced it would be his final season as head coach. I said, I'm going to coach one more year. This is your last chance at me. Because I was burnt out, you know, getting burnt out. I said, I'm going to do it one more year, and that's all. And uh, it happened, we won it again. So. Even the unstoppable Wilt Chamberlain couldn't topple Boston. In each of Red's last two years, the Celtics defeated Wilt and the Sixers en route to the finals, while creating one of the game's most unforgettable moments. Greer putting the ball on a play. He gets it out deep and have a check field. With nine NBA crowns to his credit, Red Auerbach would retire as the NBA's winningest coach of all time. But he wasn't through making history. Red announced that center Bill Russell would succeed him by becoming the team's player coach, making Russell the first African-American head coach in U.S. sports history. After compiling an unmatched run of success, Red Auerbach stepped down as Celtics head coach leaving the team in the hands of his incomparable center, Bill Russell. Russell tried to get me not to quit, but I had made up my mind. And finally one day he says, can I talk to you? I said, yeah. He says, you know, at this stage of my career, I don't really want to play for anybody else but you. Can I have the job? I said, uh, you got it. Because who can motivate Bill Russell better than Bill Russell? For all his skills as a teacher of the game, Red's people skills were just as important. They always just say, how did you handle Russell? How did you, you don't handle players, you handle animals. You deal with players. We had a problem, we talk it over. I call what the Celtics was under Red Auerbach, basketball's Casa Nostra. He made us believe, like the Casa Nostra, this was our thing. At two minutes of a ball game, and the Celtics down 10, this would be the conversation. Has anybody got anything? And you were expected to tell him what you thought you could do. I respected Russell. I respected Cousy and Heinsohn and Ramsey and all those guys. I respected them. They were college people. They were intelligent. I think I would have been successful, but I don't think I would have been as successful for any other coach. But I never felt like I was working for Red. I always felt we were working together. We treat them as men. These are highly intelligent men. And we built up that they knew that if they had a problem, they could see me or they could see Walter Brown, and we would do whatever we could to alleviate that problem. We were the Celtics, and we cared about each other, and we took care of each other. And I think the basic reason that was so successful is that every one of those guys respected Red, and Red respected us. I just looked at it, doing my job, winning as many games as I can, and presenting a good product to the fans. We had great fans. And uh, we knew that the bottom line was to win. 
Grant went on to become general manager of the Celtics, where his commitment to winning would continue. As the architect of their teams of the 1980s, Red would help lead Boston to three more NBA championships, and he would garner the love and respect of a new generation of players. Red, you, you want to say something? What I want to say is, you know how it feels because you've been here before. Me, I haven't scored a point. You yeah, know? but you kind of brought the guys here that scored the points. Well, so you're overpaid. No, no. <laughs> The Celtics were a way of life to me. A group of people so diverse you cannot imagine, working together day in and day out for a common goal. Red's theory was 10 players, two baskets, 13,000 people, one basketball. And we will decide what is done with that one basketball. Basketball is a team game. If you have the proper chemistry, proper mystique, and the ability to have fondness for each other, that takes care of a lot of ills. Sure, I, I know it doesn't take the place of talent. I understand that. But you get both, and you got an uh, unbeatable situation. Whether it was on the sidelines or in the front office, Red Arbag had a hand in all 16 Celtic championships in a 30-year span, and he became an NBA icon. The league's Coach of the Year trophy bears his name, one of many honors he's received throughout his lifetime. They also include a retired number with the Celtics, a life-size sculpture in Boston's historic Faneuil Hall, and a number of honorary degrees from universities up and down the East Coast. He's also the author of seven books, including his first, Basketball for the Player, the Fan, and the Coach. And no one has written more chapters of the NBA's history than Hall of Famer Red Auerbach. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on NBA TV's Basketballography.